Okay, so that's then the, the thermochemistry of um, isooctane. Okay, so there, there are different, I, I'll show you tomorrow morning, and I was, just spoke with Saha, and he said he sent an email last night, but, but there was an executable in there, so it may have been, the firewall may have stopped it getting through and so on. So he's resent it this morning, and he hopes that you've gotten it. Um, so what I'd like to do tomorrow morning is we'll start with that for an hour, maybe go through just calculating a few molecules, getting you used to the software and so on. So if you can, please do download it and have everything working and ready to go tomorrow when, um, when we, we start. Okay. And I said don't forget to do the, the DOS emulator as well, downloading DOSBox. I, I sent some details. Right. So. For here? Yeah, right. Okay, there, there, there isn't a two-fold symmetry because it's tetrahedron structure. There is no, there is no two-fold symmetry here. Yes, there is a, a three-fold symmetry around here because you can rotate this carbon atom into three different orientations and you see the same thing. But here, here you don't, okay? Now, one other thing. When you abstract this hydrogen atom, and you create the radical, then these do relax, and you've got this two-fold sim. It's not tetrahedron anymore. It's um, trigonal planar or whatever it is for a um, sp2 hybridized structure. And then you do have, I can't remember the, the term, I should know it, but you do then have a two-fold symmetry. So when you have a, ter a tertiary group like this, a tertiary carbon atom, and you abstract the tertiary hydrogen atom, then you add a two-fold symmetry for the radical relative to the parent. So it does increase the, the uh, symmetry. Okay? So just be, be aware of that. Okay? But uh, yeah, somebody else asked that at the break as well. Okay, so the, then software to use Benson's additivity method, actually the first one was Therm, and that's why in Livermore we've used it, and I've always used Therm, by updating the, the group values and so on um, in there. So the NIST database, there, there is a program online if you go to the NIST webbook, and that was also developed around the same time, and you can use that. Thurgas was developed by um, Holmes group, and now it's uh, Frederic Batan Leclerc's group uh, in Nancy um, in 1995, and th that is available if you ask them for tire gas, they can provide it uh, for you. Another uh, software is Cranium from the Joback group, uh, or, or sorry, groups of Joback is estimation of other properties like the temperature fusion and so on. And then we also have quantum chemistry software, and what I do now as best I can is take the best calculated thermochemical properties from um, ab initio calculations and try and update the group values as best I can. So I still use group additivity for the larger molecules because a lot of them are unknown and you have to estimate them as best you can. Okay. But there's semi-empirical approach and, and then more um, advanced approaches. Okay. So what about then thermochemistry in Chemkin? Because most people use Chemkin to do their combustion uh, kinetic calculations, okay? So Chemkin uses standard state thermodynamic properties given as polynomial fits to the specific heats at constant pressure. So we have the heat, specific heat over R is the sum of these polynomial values times T raised to N to the power n minus one, okay? And then the heat, heat of formation is equal to the integral of ncp dt. So we have to integrate these, the sum of these polynomial expression or polynomial values, okay? And then for the entropy, we have h over rt, and it's the sum of these polynomial fits over n. You've got these expressions, okay? So you, we have to use these, so 
R is the constant heat of formation at zero Kelvin, but is normally evaluated for the heat of formation at 298 Kelvin. So where A, N plus one times, times R, okay? So let's look at it. So the entropy is the integral from zero to T of CP over T dt, okay? And we have these values then for the entropy, okay? So we use these polynomial values, okay? And these are used in Kempkin all the time. So let, let's, let's look at what it really looks like um, if we go here. So here we have, the, that's the polynomials for, um, what is it, phenoxy radical. And this is dimethyl ether, okay? And so typically we have, this is just the, mo the molecule descriptor, C6H5O, okay? We have the date that it was formed, it was, it was generated, the thermochemistry was generated using the therm program. There's six carbon atoms, five hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, and it's, the, it's gas phase thermochemistry. The low temperature range ranges from 300 Kelvin up to 1400 Kelvin, and the high temperature range then ranges from 1404 to 5000. Okay, so if we look at calculation, what did I do? take the other? So if we look at the heat capacity, CP as a function of temperature, what do we see? We see something like this, okay? And so we need to define very accurately the heat capacity because the enthalpy is NCP dt, the integral of NCP dt, and the entropy is CP over T dt, okay? So we need, if we want to have accurate enthalpy and entropy values, we have to have accurate CP values, okay? And to fit this expression over a wide range, they, using just seven polynomials wouldn't be accurate enough, okay? So what, what happens is this, this temperature range gets split into two different ones. So from 300 to, we'd say 1400, we might have one set of polynomials a1 to A7, and then from 1400 up to 5000, in this case, we have another set of seven polynomials. And that way we can accurately calculate the heat capacity over the complete range from 300 to 5000 Kelvin. Okay? Okay, so, so this tells us where the break occurs between the low temperature range and the high temperature range. And then these first seven polynomials are actually the high temperature range. So the range of polynomials that are active from 1404 to 5000 Kelvin. And then the second seven are the polynomials A1 to A7 that define the heat capacity from 300 to 1404 Kelvin. And then we can accurately calculate the enthalpy and entropy from 300 to 5,000 Kelvin using those polynomials, okay? So if I go back, if we look at the heat capacity then, it's polynomial that A1 plus A2 times T plus A3 times T squared plus A4 times T cubed and A plus A5 times T to the four, okay? So this is how we get the heat capacity. And then the enthalpy is, is this, we integrate CP dt and the entropy is the integral of CP over T dt, okay? And we, we use then, for the enthalpy, we need six values. And for the entropy, we, knew, we need a seventh, okay? So we use A1 to A5 and then A7 plus the constant, okay? So we have the entropy over R. And that way, so with seven numbers or seven polynomial values, we can accurately calculate the enthalpy, sorry, the heat capacity, enthalpy, and entropy of any molecule or any species, molecular radical. Okay? 
and that's what's contained in the NASA polynomials. Okay. And so that's how they're calculated. So we get fits then, and, and term calculates, so the code calculates the enthalpy, entropy, and heat capacity values at different temperatures, and then generates the polynomials and gives you the NASA polynomial expressions that exist like this. Okay? And so here they are calculated for phenoxy radical and for dimethyl ether. Okay? And you can see that the break, okay, they, they both range from 300 to 5,000 Kelvin, but the break temperature is a little bit different in both cases. Okay? So the low temperature range here ranges from 300 to 1364, whereas for phenoxy it's 1404. Okay? But it's normally typically around that uh, temperature range at the break. Okay? And that's just because of the way the polynomial expression, it requires that level of detail to get accurate values for the um, heat, uh, heat capacity value. So that's it. And where do we get these tables then? They, they, they're available at Janov Thermit Chemical Tables. You can Google these and you'll, you'll find them. If you go to the NIST web book, uh, the thermochemistry are often available for uh, some of the species. Uh, there's a computational chemistry comparison benchmark data. As I, as I mentioned before, the active thermochemical tables from Branko Rusik. Mo mostly here, they it's the heat of formation values that are available. And thermal and ideal gas condensed phase thermochemical databases for combustion from Alex Burkat. And I think this has been taken over. I can't remember her name. Mendeley or I, I, I can't think exactly. But this has been taken over now uh, by a different person. Okay. So that's the end of the, the presentation on the thermochemistry. So, but these polynomials, and actually, if you go to any of the mechanism websites that are even our own in Galway or Livermore or any of the combustion groups, um, Hai Wong's in Stanford, USC, um, um, Professor Williams' group, U San Diego, all of the mechanisms provide tables of thermo th thermodynamic data for all of the species that are relevant to the mechanism. And they all have this NASA polynomial uh, expression. So you've got the, the 14 parameter fit to the thermochemistry. Okay. So that's, that's that. So we can start on the, the kinetics. I'm calling it day two, but it, it's not. So some basic chemical kinetic principles then. So I'm going to, it's, it's what you've done at undergraduate level, and most of you are probably very aware, but I, I'll just go through it quite quickly. Um, so and I, I'll, I'll talk about first and second order reactions, and then kinetics and flow reactors, plug versus stirred reactor, and then talk about the temperature dependence on the Arrhenius equation, equation, and then some complex reactions, chain reactions, polymerization, explosion, branching chain reactions. Um, and it's, again, we go back to this slide where we have kinetics and equilibrium. And initially, what we're talking about is kinetics. On this side, we have some sort of a break. It's sort of a gray area. And then we have equilibrium. Okay? And what links the two is um, thermodynamics. Okay. But if we just think the rate of reaction, what does rate of reaction depend on? Okay, so um, if we have a lot of people in a room, the likelihood that they're going to bump bump against one another is high. If we have very few people in the room, the likelihood that you're going to bump up against one another is very low. Okay, so the rate of reaction then obviously is going to depend on concentration. The more um, of something that we have in a box or in a, in a system, the, the higher the concentration, the more collisions, the more reactions that are going to occur. So rate is proportional to concentration. Okay? And that's fairly obvious. All right? 
But if something is proportional to something else, then what is that something equal to? Rate is proportional to concentration, so rate is equal to what? The constant times concentration. Okay, you all know that. And what is that constant? We call it the rate constant. Okay? And as a kineticist, my job really, okay, okay, we measure rates, but my job is to determine what is the rate constant of a reaction. Okay? So as a kineticist, I'm a rate constant determiner. Right? That's my job. Right? And so, and, and typically in any system, we know the concentration of the species that we put into a reactor or whatever. We know the concentrations. So what are we really, if, we're de if we want to determine the rate, what are we really determining? We're determining the rate constant. So that's your job as a kineticist, is to be a rate constant determiner. Okay. So, okay, so if we go back a little earlier, here we have just a complex reaction. And it's just an example. So if we, and I, I, I teach these to the undergrads, I'm going to teach it the same way to you guys. It's probably oversimplified. But anyway, if we take Br minus, BrO3 minus, and H plus, and we put it all into a container, and we seal the container, right? How do we monitor the rate of that reaction? If they're, if they're all going to react inside the container, how are we going to monitor that? Okay, we can get, we have a little septum on the container, and we take a syringe at certain time uh, intervals, and we can monitor the change of any of the species. We can monitor the change of Br minus, BrO3 minus, H plus, Br2, or H2O. We can monitor any one of those five different species as a function of time. And then we can measure the rate of reaction. Okay, Versus, because we can look at the change with time. So, but the rate in each one reaction, we know that five Br minuses are consumed. Okay, so let's say we put in 100 Br minuses into the container. After the first time interval, we have 95 left. At the second time interval, we have 90. At the third interval, we have 85, and so on. Okay, then we know that at every time interval, one reaction is occurring because in each one reaction, five get consumed, right? So it's the rate of reaction is minus one-fifth the rate of change of Br minus with respect to time because in every one reaction, five Br minuses are consumed, okay? So the rate of, of a reaction is minus one-fifth the rate of change of Br minus with respect to time, okay? And it's the same then with BrO3 minus it's minus just the change in BrO3 minus with respect to time because one Br minus gets consumed. Or it's minus one sixth the change in H plus with respect to time. Or it's plus one third the rate of change of Br2 with respect to time or one third the rate of change of water with respect to time. So it's negative for reactants and positive for products because what is the rate of change of Br minus with respect to time as a reactant? It's always negative. So we have minus minus, which becomes positive. Okay? So all of these are equal. And we can measure if we if we if we uh, following the rate of change of any of the species, reactant or product, we can measure the rate of reaction by doing any of them. But we have to consider the sociometric coefficient of each species that are, um, as it's being consumed but all of them are equal. Or what we write is the rate is equal to, and as I said, and as you rightly told me, it's the rate is proportional to the concentration of reactants, or it's equal to a constant times the concentration of reactants. So we write the rate is equal to a constant times the concentration of Br minus raised to the power of alpha, times BrO3 minus raised to the power of beta, times the concentration of H plus raised to the gamma, right? And experimentally, it was found for this reaction that alpha is one, beta is one, and gamma is two. So this is the, the true rate expression. And this is how we express 
the rate of reaction. It's equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the reactants raised to some power. Okay, now, that's true, but that's only true at the very early stages of reaction. Okay, so when I'm talking, and certainly in these, in this um, things today, I'm talking at the very early stages of reaction in, the, in this zone here, where really the concentration of the products hasn't reached an appreciable concentration to contribute, right? Because if we think about it, sorry, get rid of this. If we think about it, yes, the rate of reaction in this zone here, the true rate of reaction is equal to the rate in the forward direction minus the rate in the reverse direction, right? You have to consider reverse reaction too, okay? So at the very start, we have a high concentration of A, we have no B. And so the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to some power. We don't know what it is. Well, we do because just looking at that, we know it's first order, all right? Okay, so A, uh, the power is one, alpha is one, okay? But it, the true rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to some power minus the rate constant in the reverse direction times the concentration of B raised to some power, okay? But if B is zero, then the reverse rate is zero, okay? Here, it's still appreciably small, so the reverse rate doesn't interfere very much. But it is interfering somewhat, so you're not precisely right, okay? But when I talk in the next slides or whatever, I'm talking about the very early stages of reaction, when we're just considering reactants, and the concentrations of the products are so small that the reverse rate really isn't contributing, okay? So bear that in mind, because strictly speaking, what I'm saying is not 100% true if you're, and certainly it's not true when you're out here, because at equilibrium, of course, the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal, and the concentrations of the species aren't changing anymore. All right, so then we take any situation where we have M modes of A reacting with N modes of B, giving us P modes of X and Q modes of Y. Then the rate is minus the stoichiometric coefficient, minus one over M, the change in concentration of A with respect to time, or minus one over N, the change in concentration of B with respect to time, and so on, or plus one over P dx, change in concentration of X with respect to time, and plus one over Q, change in concentration of Y with respect to time. The units, pardon me, of rate are concentration per unit time. And in SI units, it will be moles per meter cubed per second, but more practically, it's moles per decimeter cubed per second, um, we, we would normally say. So, and how does the rate depend on, on concentrations? Typically, we find out by experiment. And again, the rate law equation is the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of reactants raised to some power. A to the, con a, the concentration of A to the alpha, B to the beta, and so on. And the order then, the total order of reaction is the sum of the partial orders of each of the reactants. Okay, so it would be alpha plus beta plus gamma, and it's normally dimensionless. And the rate constant uh, is K, we write as K subscript N, so if it's a first order, we write one K subscript one, second order, two, and so on. Um, and the rate is equal to K subscript N when each concentration is unity. Okay. So let's look at this experiment rate laws. We have CO plus CL2 gives COCl2. And it's found by experiment that the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of CO to the power of one times CL2 to the power of a half. So it's the total order of this reaction is one plus a half, it's one and a half order, okay? For this reaction, H2 plus I2 gives 2HI. The rate is equal to the rate constant times H2 to the power of 1 times the concentration of I2 to the power of 1. So it's 1 plus 1 is 2, so it's second order. And here, for this very similar reaction, except it's, it's Br2 instead of I2, the rate has this very complicated uh, expression here, 
And so we can't define the order. It's undefinable. Okay. So where do we then get um, the rate laws? Or where do we get? So how do we find the order of reaction? Okay. So if we have A modes of A giving us products, this is the simplest um, thing altogether, then the rate law, the rate is equal to minus 1 over A, the change in concentration of A with respect to time. And that's equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to some power N. We don't know what it is. Okay? So we can rewrite it and say, right, well, the rate is equal to uh, minus the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of N. Okay? I just redefine this. Okay, so we have here now, so for first order reaction, then we set N is equal to 1. It's first order. So we have the rate is equal to the change in concentration of A with respect to time, and that's equal to minus the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of 1. Okay? And so we re reorder, rewrite the equation, we get this expression here. And then if we integral, integrate from time 0 to time t, concentration of A times 0 to times concentration of A times T, the change in concentration of A over the concentration of A uh, is equal to the rate constant from 0 to T dt. Then the integral of 1 over x dx is the log of x. So it's the log of x ranging from um, x at 0 to x at T. So it's the log of x at times T minus the log of x at times 0. In this case, the log of the concentration of A times T minus the log of the concentration of A times 0 is equal to minus K times T, because typically T0 is 0. Okay? So we, we can rewrite this as the log of the concentration of A at any time is the log of concentration of A times 0 minus KT. Okay? So Y is equal to MX plus C. So if we plot the log of the concentration of A at any time versus time, we should get a straight line, the slope of which is minus the rate constant, and the y-intercept is log of a at time 0. Okay? You've, this is all done before. This is handy, though, um, if we look at it a little bit in a different way. So if we, instead of expressing the expression like this, we express it like this. We have log of a at t over a0 is equal to minus kt. Okay, well, we can write it like this then. And then we have the concentration of A at any time is the concentration of time 0 times e to the minus kt. So we see, look at, you guys all know that, but when I'm teaching undergrads, we have the concentration of A at any time is exponent, exponentially dependent on time. Okay? And you see that when you plot the concentration of A at any time, you can see that there's an exponential dependence. So we know then that the A is obeying first order kinetics and N is 1. Okay? And then if we plot log of A versus time, we get a straight line, the slope of which is minus the rate constant. All right? Okay. But if we look at it, if we look then at um, the expression in this way, and we define the half life, the half life is the time taken for the concentration of A to reach half its original value, then we have the log of a half, a0 over a0, is equal to minus k times t a half. Okay? So then we have log of a half is equal to minus k times t a half, and then we have the half-life is 0.693 all over the rate constant, or the rate constant is 0.693 all over the half-life. Okay? You've all done this before. Okay? But this is, this is interesting. You know, if, if you're, you know, if there were, for carbon dating, this is how, what they use. So they, they know, basically, the concentration, if you can tell the concentration of carbon-14 in a sample, then you, you can say, well, log of the concentration, whatever it is, times the concentration of 0 over 0. So the log of whatever fraction is there is equal to minus the rate constant times t a half. And we know the, the rate constant for carbon-14 decay, so then you can actually tell the age of a sample 
containing carbon-14, depending on the concentration of carbon-14 that's in it. And that's how they do carbon-14 dating, because of it obeys first-order decay. Okay? So, just to say that. And so, when is the first-order reaction over? Okay? And if we look at the concentration of A at any time is equal to its original concentration time, times the exponent of minus kT. So, technically, it only reaches completion at infinite time. But it's, you can tell that it's over fairly early, like mostly over fairly early in the thing because of it, its exponential decay. Okay, and then for, second or, for a second order reaction, we have, again, A giving us products. We have the rate is equal to the change in concentration of A with respect to time, and that's minus the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the second power, raised to the power of two, okay? And we have the change in concentration of A all over A to the power of two is equal to minus the rate constant times dt. And if we integrate this from the concentration of A times zero to the concentration of A times t, we have the change in concentration of A over the concentration of A squared. Um, we get one over the concentration of A at time zero minus one over the concentration of A at time t is minus the rate constant times t. Or we can rewrite it and we have one over the concentration of A at time t is equal to kt plus one over the concentration at time zero, concentration of A at time zero. So a plot of one over the concentration of A at any time versus time, if the, if the A obeys second order kinetics, should give you a straight line the slope of which is the rate constant, and the wire's intercept is one over the concentration of A at time zero, okay? And this is what I've shown here. If we, we plot one over the concentration of the species versus time, the slope is equal to the rate constant. Now, what are the units of the rate constant? Sorry, I, I should have mentioned that for first order. For first order, we plot log of concentration versus time. So the units of a first order rate constant are inverse unit time, okay? One over unit time, okay? For the slope of a second order reaction, or the units of the rate constant of a second order reaction then, it's going to be inverse concentration per unit time, always, because you're plotting one over concentration versus time. So it's the units of y over x. Okay, and then the half-life of a second-order reaction, again, is the time taken for a species to reach half its original concentration. So we have one over the concentration of A at the half-life is a half A0. So we have one over a half A0, which is two over A0, minus one over A0 is equal to rate constant times a half-life. So we have then one over the concentration of A at time zero is equal to the rate constant times the half-life are one over the rate constant times the concentration of A at time zero is the half-life. Okay, that's the second order reaction. Okay, and typically, species of A, typically first or second order kinetics, typically, if it's an elementary reaction. Okay, so, and let's talk about the rate law of elementary reactions. So, if, if, if I go back, to this example, and just to bear this in mind, when, we, when I was talking earlier about this reaction, right, what is the likelihood of five atoms of Br minus, or five, sorry, yeah, and, and one molecule of BrO3 and six H ion atoms all coming together at the same place at the same time? What's the chances of that? Zero, okay? So will that, is that reaction going to be elementary? And the answer is no, okay? And so when we work out the rate law for that reaction, we find that it's, it's equal to the rate constant times the concentration of Br minus to the one, BrO minus to the one, and H plus to the two, okay? That's what it's found by experiment. And we'll see in a few minutes how that's actually determined, okay? But we can tell even by looking at it, that that reaction cannot be elementary, okay? It can't be, 
And so it's not going to depend on the stoichiometric coefficients, okay? And it doesn't. You can see it's one, one, and two, even though it's five, one, and six, okay? So it's, it's different from the stoichiometric coefficient, okay? However, if a reaction is elementary, then it does obey the stoichiometric coefficient, um, does follow the stoichiometric coefficient thing. So, so the law of mass action applies, essentially. And so the rate of reaction is, propor is proportional to the product of active masses of reactants. So it's the molar concentration raised to the power of the number of species. So here, we, for example, we have A giving us products P and Q. And we can write then the rate is equal to the first order rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of one. If we have A plus B giving us C plus D, the rate is equal to the second order rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of one times the concentration of B raised to the power of one. And if we have 2A plus B giving us E, F, and G, then the rate is the third order rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of two times B raised to the power of one. What if this was A plus A giving us B plus C? What would that rate be equal to? Pardon? It's going to be, the rate will be a second order rate constant times the concentration of rate A raised to the power of two. It's the same as two A giving us B plus C, okay? So it's second order, okay? And so if a reaction is elementary and it occurs as written, then it does depend on the stoichiometric coefficient. The, the, the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the species raised to the stoichiometric coefficient if the reaction is elementary, if it occurs as written. But you cannot, oftentimes you cannot tell whether it's going to occur as written or not. When we write chemical kinetic mechanisms, each reaction is elementary. So it does occur as written, okay? And that's the detailed chemical kinetic mechanism development. You have the, the fundamental rate constant. You know it, whether it's first or second order um, for each reaction. So what about the molecularity then? So if it's a unimolecular decay, we have A going to products, then the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of one. So here, this is unimolecular. Bimolecular, we have A plus B giving us products. And again, we could have A plus A giving us products. That's still bimolecular. And the rate would be the second order rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the power of two, okay? Term molecular, we have A plus B plus C, or we could have three A, maybe, giving us products, okay? And we have its third order rate constant times the concentration of A to the power of one, B to the power of one, C to the one. And then tetramolecular don't exist. So no other reactions are feasible. Statistically, they're highly unlikely to occur, and we don't write them. And even, actually, term molecular reactions, typically we write them as having zero as a rate constant, okay? Now, that's not always true. So if you have a reaction H plus O2 plus M giving you HO2 plus M, okay? The rate of that reaction is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of, of H to the power of one, O2 to the power of one, and M to the power of one, okay? But M is all the concentration of all the species in the system. That is third order, but it is an important reaction in combustion, okay? So in those cases, we do write them. But typically, if we have intermediate species and we have three species being produced, the reverse rate is typically zero, okay? Because um, just the likelihood of the three of them reacting together to give us products is statistically highly unlikely. Even, and then term molecular or tetramolecular, completely unlikely, okay? So we go back, this was one of the examples that I gave a little bit earlier about how we tell from experiment that what the, what the stoichiometric coefficients actually are, or what the, the powers are, and the rate law is. 
So for this reaction, CO plus Cl2, giving you CoCl2, it doesn't, it's not first order with respect to CO and Cl2. It is for CO, but it's a half order for Cl2. So we know immediately that this reaction is not elementary. Okay? Now, if it was, but even if it, if it was written as uh, the rate of reaction is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of CO to the power of 1 and Cl2 to the power of 1, that doesn't necessarily still mean that the reaction is elementary. And I'll show you that in a second as well. All right? But, but we can tell for sure here now, because it's a half order with respect to Cl2, the, the reaction does not proceed as written. Okay? So, but there must be some sort of a series of elementary reactions that we can write that will give us the mechanism for this reaction. Okay? And it actually occurs in four different steps. Okay? So we have Cl2 giving us two chlorine radicals. That's the initial decay of Cl2. And then a chlorine radical reacts with CO to give us COCl. And that's collision reaction. And then COCl reacts with Cl, another molecule of Cl2, to give us COCl. And then one of the chlorines that was free from here reacts with one of the chlorines that's chlorine radicals that are formed here, they recombine to give us back Cl2. And so now we have all of the products, we have CoCl2, and we've uh, reproduced back Cl2 again. Okay? So Cl2 hasn't been created or destroyed, it's, it's um, intact. Okay? So steps one to four constitute or comprise the mechanism of the reaction. Okay? So if we look at the breakdown, though, and if we assume that steps two and three here are slow in, cons in comparison to one and four. So this is essentially in equilibrium. Cl2 is giving us uh, two Cls, and two Cls are going back to Cl2 really quickly. That happens really quickly. So we can say, well, that's in equilibrium. Okay? Then we can say, right, well, Cl2 is giving us two Cls. So the equilibrium constant is equal to the concentration of Cl, radical, raised to the power of 2, all over the concentration of Cl2. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Or the concentration of Cl, then, is equal to the square root of the equilibrium constant times the concentration of Cl2. Okay, or, or you can write it like that. All right? So, but if we look at the second reaction, we can say, right, the rate of this reaction what is it? It's an elementary, so it's equal to the rate constant times the concentration of Cl times the concentration of, to the power of 1, sorry, times the concentration of CO to the power of 1. Okay? So the change in CO with, the change in concentration of CO with respect to time is equal to the rate of this reaction here. It's the only one where CO is being consumed. Okay? And so that's equal to, um, the rate constant for, reaction to, for this reaction times the concentration of Cl, but the concentration of Cl is equal to the square root of the equilibrium constant times the concentration of Cl2 to the power of a half. Okay? Well, we, we get two Cl radicals and then we have one, one left over, so one of them gets consumed here, one of them's left over, and then, oh yeah, we get two Cl2s reused. Okay, yeah, I know what you're saying. And we get back Cl2. But anyway, we just assume that it's in equilibrium. I know what you're saying, right? Okay, and then it's equal to this times the concentration of CO. Okay, so we predict that the observed rate constant is equal to the rate constant for this reaction times the square root of the equilibrium constant for the equilibrium of Cl2 with two chlorine radicals. Okay? So how would we, how would we uh, prove that? What you'd have to do is, well, we, presumably we know the equilibrium constant for this reaction. Okay? So to prove it, we'd have to measure the rate constant for this reaction. And then see for the overall process 
does the rate constant for the overall process equal to the measured rate constant for that reaction two times the square, the con square root of the equilibrium constant. And that would then prove that mechanism. Okay, so that would answer, then answer your question. Okay. Okay, so here's another example of a complex and it's more combustion related. So we have acetaldehyde giving us methane plus CO. But if you look at this, you get, you get methane plus CO in over 90% yield, but you also get traces of ethane and hydrogen and acetone and so on. And actually the rate law is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of acetaldehyde raised to one and a half power, okay? And actually you see this for lots of um, fuels. So typically the rate law of any fuel decay typically is equal to some, the general form is equal to some rate constant times the concentration of the fuel raised to one and a half power, right? Certainly for a pyrolysis uh, process. Why? Because if we look at it, acetaldehyde here can undergo unimolecular decay to give us methyl and HCO, or it can give us CH3CO plus H, or whatever. But also then, the methyl radical that's produced here can abstract a hydrogen atom from acetaldehyde, giving us methane and uh, this radical CH3CO. And then CH3CO can decompose to give us methyl plus CO, and methyl can recombine it with itself to give us ethane, okay? So we do, you can see here then, that we do form methane and CO, but we, it also explains how we can get some ethane produced and so on, okay? So it just doesn't happen in one step. And you can see actually that what's happening in the fuel, it's undergoing unimolecular decay, so the rate of this reaction is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of acetaldehyde raised to the power of one. The rate of this reaction is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of acetaldehyde to the power of one times methyl to the power of one. So that's a second order reaction overall, okay? And then also you'll get H atom produced, so you'll have H plus acetaldehyde will give you, pardon me, H2 plus CH3CO. So that's also going to be second order. So the consumption of acetaldehyde involves both first and second order reactions. So the overall rate depends on the rate constant of the system times the concentration of the fuel raised to the one and a half order, which is sort of halfway between first and second order. And it makes sense. And you can see this actually from a lot of fuels, most fuels for pyrolysis, you'll see that it depends typically on an overall global rate constant times the concentration of the fuel raised to the power of 1.5 because it involves first and second order kinetics. Okay, and probably let's, let's quit at that and we'll take another break and we'll start it up again at 10 past 11, okay? <laughs>